Thanks, Timothy. I think it is. I appreciate everything you are doing. Um, why do you think, I guess this is for Max, why do you think that the media portrays the well Latino leadership um, not so much as they don't bring the rough to the black community that they bring? That's a very good question, and I'll, and I'll tell you the answer from my perspective. I have various theories, but you know, if you look at history, number one, I mean, in this country, particularly in the Southwest, Latinos in the land have been a huge thing, right? Immigration. If someone brings up immigration, Latinos are on that, like white on rice on a paper plate on a snowstorm. You know what I'm saying? The black community is very intimate with police brutality. You know, we have these historical incidents that have happened throughout the years, whether it be Rodney King, whether it be MLK, whether it be Emmett Till. You can go all the way back and see police brutality. So one incident of police brutality happens, the black community is ready to mobilize. For us, it ain't really there yet. But it is there for immigration. An uh, example of this would be plain and simple if anyone's paying attention to the Donald Trump saga. As soon as this guy says something about Mexicans coming into this country, oh, you got LULAC, you got NCLR, everybody's making press releases, statements to say, hey, who is this joker? That's why. It's these historical things. I've been trying to get the Latino community to pay attention to some of the injustices that are happening. But then again, you talk about our upbringing again. One of the things that most people don't know about Latinos in this country is that they were lynched by Texas Rangers. Because after the Mexican, after the Mexican-American War, they wanted the land. To, to get us out of the land when we didn't want to leave, what are they gonna do? Call the Texas Rangers, the posse, and get us out of here, right? We had people who fought back, Joaquin Murrieta, Gregorio Cortez, we had those guys who tried. Exactly. So given that we have the Chicano history of Chicano kind of movement that stemmed from all of us just talking about police brutality, why don't we have it now as loud as the black community and why is there that division? When is the third group going to I mean, we're in San Antonio, which is the Tex-Mex mecca of the world, right? We're in the Southwest, right? We're Tejanos and we're proud. We're Chicanos, right? LA, San Diego, Arizona, right? Where are we at? I'm trying to mobilize. Listen, I'm going out to New York at the end of the month to talk about Latino justice. And man, we're about to get this thing popping. Because we can't, we, what are we going to continue to sit around and take this for, man? You know, it continues to happen. We need to, keep, we need to mobilize, man. We need to get with it. You know, the Chicano moratorium happened. You know, who was it? Salazar. They got popped by the police out there in L.A., right? Was that his name? Ruben Salazar was popped by the police, right? Because he was a journalist talking about the injustice and the corrupt LAPD. Listen, Rampart, police brutality and the injustice from the courts to the prisons to the police, man. It's, they've all had it on us, man. We've been pegged with, with the target, with the targets on our chest, man. My name is Hubi Thea, and I actually work at the health department in the city, and um, I'm violence with the youth violence prevention, and um, we're implementing locally the care violence, you know, the care violence model out of Chicago, um, which is a public health model to prevent violence in the inner city. Um, my question is about, um, I know in Public health, and we talk a lot about there's a lot of conversations going on at the national level on um, substance abuse. Um, you know, there, there's an opioid abuse epidemic, and they're talking a lot about decriminalizing that and really looking at it from a public health perspective. Um, we, it, it hasn't, everybody knows that they're having this conversation now nationally because that is overwhelmingly now affecting you know, rural white people. Um, so now it's a it's a policy priority. So any thoughts on that? Because I know that hasn't really you know the neighborhoods that we work in in San Antonio we're not seeing that because it's more of a rural phenomenon. But I just wanted to get your opinion on that. Oh, and by the way, just so you, you can um, El Salvador and. Honduras are the murder capitals of the world, um, and also the femicide capitals of the world. So you're essentially putting these women back uh, into a death sentence. So, so that's even more than Iraq or Syria or Mexico, um, and that's never that's never really mentioned. Here. I think the detractors will, will always say, "Hey, why does this always have to be a racial issue?" Why is it why is it that you know 
again, the anti-immigration sentiment is why are these people that are coming here, why is it our responsibility to take care of them? That's what the, that's what the detractors will say. I mean, I think also when you talk about immigration, which we're having a discussion on Sunday as a part of Dream Week, if you check your Dream Week schedules, um, I would encourage everyone to come to that. Um, you know, we talk about this country being one of, of goodwill, right? That's what, the, that's what the sentiment is, that if you come here, we'll take care of you as a nation of immigrants, and everyone deserves a chance to, to achieve the American dream. We see that not so much, right? We're talking about children, women getting locked up. People come in here at, you know, from the border and getting tossed right back to where, where they're at, and it is a death sentence. Um, what can we do to stop that? I don't know. You know, I think everybody felt good about the State of the Union address last night, which it sounded great, but um, one of the questions before that, uh, the Dem Forum was, hey, will you be the next deporter in chief to Hillary Clinton, right? Because these deportations, these raids, I mean, man, it's tough. Can you imagine seeing some of that stuff, like, firsthand? You know, a camera phone on a raid, someone getting, coming into your home and just destroying the family? In the end, America as a capitalistic society has to figure out a way to maximize profit, right? So if it's marijuana, if it's cocaine, if it's crack, if it's opiates, if my brothers up here have it, and, and, or if everybody has something on them, the individuals who are gonna pay the price the most are the black and the brown communities, right? Now, when it, studies come out to show that white men, white women, or the white community use the same drug just as much, but are criminalized less, then, as Maxwell keeps using this word truth, comes to light, people are saying, wait a minute. So the same goes to uh, how the prison population reflects that, that it just way we incarcerate. So your question talked about decriminalization. So now we got to figure out, okay, well, too many now, when you say they start to change the policies, when white people get affected over in the NEISD district, you know, they have the same amount of drug use as they do on the east side and the west side. But Ray Ray is getting locked up more than Johnny. Why? Because Johnny's dad works in City Hall. And Ray Ray's dad is locked up. So when Jose does the same thing, that's how it's, it's, it's looked upon. So we have to now, so America says, well, we got, a, we got a problem. It's only a problem when it affects white dollars and capitalism. And that's just the way it is. Because that's how this, again, this country was built. I wanted to, to talk a little bit more on some things Mike said earlier. And, uh, and that have also been said here about the social construction of crime and laws. When uh, uh, domestic violence prevention activists worked so hard to get some laws on the books so that there would be mandatory arrests of batterers, what they did is actually increase the rate at which, so yeah, they're sending people to jail, they increased the rate at which women were arrested related to defending themselves. And we have a self-defense waiver on this book. Y'all know that more, more popularly by the term stand your ground law after Florida and Trayvon Martin. But Marissa Alexander wasn't allowed to use that law when her batterer broke into her house and put her in a stranglehold and beat her. And she went and got her gun and shot it into the ceiling. It was given 20 years. <clears throat> got her convictions overturned. And then the prosecutor said, I'll get you 60. Where's the Department of Justice on that? And she was released about this time last year. That's where I met Marissa the first time. We were part of an action that was downtown uh, of about 20 different groups uh, supporting her, having a rally to support her release. And Marissa Alexander is an African-American woman with an NBA. And I believe she's still on an ankle monitor now. Again, that's Florida here under chapter C of the Texas Penal Code. Section 9.31 is our self-defense waiver. If you're in imminent harm, you can defend yourself. Section 9.33 is our defensive third party waiver. And uh, that's where you can protect another person if there's imminent harm and you have to do that. We have a lot of women incarcerated and, and other persons too, men are too. I just don't have the statistics on that and I'd like to get that because of the those recommended for pardons under SCR 26 and 91, there were about 30 women. There was one man, he killed his uncle. His uncle had been molesting him. Um, uh, 
These, these laws are on the books, but they're not one of the things we're talking about. So part of it is the way the laws are written, and then part of the ways are the un, part of the problem is the unequal lay, way that the law is interpreted and applied with regard to race, with regard to gender. So if uh, there's a man and, he, and a burglar breaks into his house, especially here in Texas, and he shoots to death that burglar, that guy, if, that guy probably won't even face arrest. Let alone, he'll probably be no build if he even uh, makes it to a grand jury. That that will not go further. But if you're a woman and you're an imminent harm and you're being battered, well, there's there's the, the choice is, and it's not really a choice. You cannot defend yourself and die, or you can defend yourself and you can go to jail or prison. So uh, these are some things we have to be uh, uh, have to be considering in criminal justice reform. So thank you. About Martin Luther King and peace in the world we face today. So I'm just going to ask the general question of the panel about religion and peace and violence in the world today, and how do we how do we address that? You know, right here in this land in San Antonio, or how do we address it anywhere else? Because you know, I think everyone here has talked about the pain and the violence in our society, but. You know, we have a global problem also. Dr. King believed in nonviolence. I don't know how he did it. You know, I know a guy who was telling me a story the other day who was part of the, back in the 60s, the Student Nonviolent Coordinator Committee, SNCC. He was uh, at a march in Chicago, and um, they were marching, and Dr. King was narrowly missed by a brick thrown at his head. I mean, I would have been, hey, you know what? Who, who just threw that brick? That's what I would have done, right? But Dr. King didn't believe in that, right? And, and how they were able to do that was just unreal. You know, I mean, we talk about today, the United States being this democracy, right? And, and instituting democracy around the world. How do we do it? We do it through violence. We do it through violence, man. It's so nasty, so ugly. You know, I want to I wanna live in a peaceful world. I do. I talk to young men all the time about peace, about having to put their hands on anybody, particularly women. I talk to young men all the time and try to serve as a mentor to young men. You know, but unfortunately, we see as violence young men in our communities. We see violence as an acceptable means of solving problems. We even joke around about it when we talk. We say, hey, let's go handle this outside. No, oh, man, let's handle this at the table. So, you know, I want to talk about spirituality and all that. But again, you know, this country, quote unquote, was founded on a spirituality, right? They came to this country with a Bible and a sword and said, take this Bible or we're going to cut your head off. I'm just saying, we're talking about truth today, right? We're talking about what really, what things we really are, you know, so. I think a lot of the stuff stems from fear. And I think the source of that fear is ignorance. And until we get to know our neighbor, until we start to talk about some of these issues, to educate ourselves about it, we can't solve the problem. So let's get out there and talk to our neighbors and see what we can do to make changes peacefully and not through the fear mongering that we see a lot of the political candidates do. Basically, acknowledging that violence is real and get to the root of the cause and really do your research and understand it and do some soul searching but then do some fierce loving, and that's the easiest thing that we can be doing as we're dealing with the fact that uh, we are perpetrating violence around the, the, the world as the biggest military uh, in the world. And, and so, you know, we, we're, on a macro level, we are violent. And it goes down to the prison uh, industrial complex, and it goes down to, to, to domestic violence and how we take care of uh, asylum seekers. So it's on every single level uh, that you that we see it, and, and we have to uh, just try every day to love each other and find ways to, to multiply that. My name is Juana Diego. I come from Michigan. I have a son who is in prison in Michigan. He's been there for seven years now. Um, has four more years to serve. He went in there a young man, very young man, young teenager, who went to model an adult. Um, life is going to be very different for him. So I don't really have, I, I could have a lot to say. But, um, I just want to make some points of interest on things that I have seen that have um, 
that I would like to see addressed at some point. The first one is the treatment of families. I mean, you go in there, I mean, it's just, just them. And, and being in prison is not just their sentence, it's a, it's a family sentence because the whole family is involved and it has changed, the dynamics can change. Um, so, and prison, the guards there, the way they treat the families is also very, it, it can sometimes be just as degrading, okay? The other one is um, the box and the promise of a job. You know, they, when you are going to be released, they want you to have a job ready. But at the same time, they have this little box that says you can't get hired if you have a felony. Okay, some of them, um, my son he came out for a while, he was blessed in that I had a couple of connections. He got a job because of a friend, but then after that, when that job was over, he couldn't find a job anymore. So, you know, he still went into depression, and, you know, it's a cycle. The other one is um, the charging for everything. They have to pay to send the money, you have to pay to send the emails, you have to pay to get a secure pack, the correct call, you know, everything they charge you for. So if you're gonna put $20 on the phone, it's gonna cost you $25. If you're gonna send $50 on commissary, it's gonna cost you $25. Everything is charged. And there are a lot of families who can't afford that. They can't be paying all that money out for that. Um, and then the prisoners on their side, if they wanna answer your email, if they wanna call you back, they have to pay also, but they're not giving them any money, and if they do get a job, like my son, he gets paid $30 a week, no, $30 a month, so, and they have to pay for everything in there also, okay? So, that, and then the other one is um, the privatization of prisons, and I, I don't know who came up with this idea of privatizing prisons, but it's just, it's a joke. It's a joke because they take so much advantage of what's going on there. And uh, let me see, education. Because they took all the education away, they could get their GED, but that's it. So, you know, like my son, he's been there for 10 years. When he comes out, he, was, he got his high school in there. But when he comes out, you know, with the world changing so much, you know, how is he going to be lost? He's going to be lost in, in that area, not trained for anything. Um, and then the last, but a very important one to me is the school prison. And how many, if you have noticed, if you have kids in, especially middle school, and how they're being built, you know, Brown Rapids, where I'm from, they built a lot of new schools. and. Ford, Ford Middle School in the black neighborhood, um, Burton's Middle School in the Latino neighborhood, they're built like prisons. And I, I'm sorry, but Irving School. <laughs> when I walked in to this Irving School here in Texas, it was like, it, it's like, you know, prison levels are running like that. You walk in and it's just, yeah. That's where we have to start. That's where we have to start because there is where they are producing on their future prisoners. That's where they're starting to take our children away. So. I was told fall a year ago when I came home and I was registered under the Workforce Incentive Act through the Workforce Commission that employers are supposed to be reviewing on a case-by-case -case basis based on the facts of your case. Now, I, I don't think that's really happening. I think that you're, it's getting thrown in the shredder pretty much. But he told me that, and he recommended I contact the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. So I emailed the federal EEOC, and I got a really long, detailed email back that was very nice, um, because I don't want to be dishonest on an application, but I also don't want to have to disclose what I don't need to disclose. In my experience, since I got out, and again, I have a PhD, and I have 29 years of professional communication experience. If I have to send in like just my resume, a cover letter, and maybe my publications, Bam, I get a job interview. But if I have to have that application when I have to disclose those felonies, it's all, it's all over. It's all over. So the EEOC told me, if you have a question about whether or not you think it's discrimination, file a complaint with us. So I want to make that clear for everybody, that there's the need to file a complaint. 
Um, for those of you who don't know, uh, Prison Legal News, with whose parent company is the, the Human uh, uh, Justice Campaign, I've got their information in the handout that's in the back. They've been doing this phone justice campaign, and uh, they have just uh, succeeded in getting the FCC to order uh, a, a, a cap and a decrease, I think, in uh, phone rates. When somebody is incarcerated in prison and jail, and family members have to accept those collect calls. They've been playing exorbitant rates. So here's another player in the, in the prison industrial complex in terms of capitalism, Securus, and all these other phone companies that provide these services um, in prison. And those, that's one thing you can get involved with. Um, uh, as for stripping of education from the prison system, it's terrible. Um, and I want you to know that here in, in the Texas Department of Criminal Justice, the men can get master's degrees the women can only get a bachelor's degree. So I just wanted to point that out. About the FCC ruling, families paid $36 million last year for those phone calls. Just to let you know how much it is. $36 million is what it costs. Um, as far as the, the degrees, they're going from $0.24 cents to $0.11. Cents, so we'll cut that $36 million in half. For uh, Ban the Box, we had a valiant effort at the state capitol to get state government to um, to remove that box off state applications, but we ran out of time because we got locked down in Planned Parenthood and Open Carry. Um, another thing uh, with the Pale Grants, uh, the community colleges in Texas and the prison system have applied to be part of the pilot program to reinstate the Pell Grants in the prison system because that was that education is one of my banners. It's what got my son through. It's what got his him his job three weeks out of the system. So that is another thing. About the treatment of families, TIFA works with TDCJ on this issue. We try to make it not a us against them type of uh, thing. We educate our families about what to expect and how they should be treated to know the rules and to help them that way. And then if we have problems with guards, we report them. We report them, we fill out reports. So that's some of the things that we, we uh, do at TIFA. So we work for all those things. When, when you're, you're told something that you can do and you can't do, like you, they give you a list in prison, like, oh, these are all the places that will hire you. When the first one at the top of the list is like Walmart, you know? It depends on your crime. It really depends on a lot of things on why you were in prison, a lot of places that will hire you. But it also, it's not about, it's about who you know. It really is. And I, I single-handedly done a lot of things while I was behind bars to push that envelope. Like I said, the resource factor, factor in my head of what I've done to get that going. I had a job a year before I came home from prison. So the day I got to the halfway house, I had a job, but they wouldn't let me go to it. You know, they had to check this out, they had to check that out. Well, they already did it. They already know everything about me. I took blood while I was in prison. They don't know everything about me. You know, there's nothing I can't hide. And the thing is this, whatever they say, when they say, you know, you gotta put this on the application, you gotta do this, I, myself, honestly, I've never said anything about my past on the application. It's none of your business because I qualify for the job. You know, it's not like I'm gonna go, I can't go work at, the, at a bank. You know, I can't go work at you know, the government jobs, like a, being a postal worker or working, because you know, they say, if you have a felony, you can't get a government job. And, well, you know, exactly. So those kind of things, like, like I said, I don't put, I don't question, I don't say, you know, oh yeah, I have a felony on my record, you know. It's, it's none of your business. I'm here to apply for a job and I have qualifications. That's just my thought on it. Um, I'm not suggesting you, you do it or don't, you know, but like being a business owner myself, personally being a small business owner, small businesses need to band together also because a lot of us, we don't, I don't require it. Like when I go ask for help or something, I'm gonna sit there, may I have a social security card number, may I have the, 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 the I go through all the, no, I don't, I don't care personally. I have a lot of trust in a lot of people. So we gotta network, we gotta continue to like, Keep everybody talking and getting everybody together because if we don't, there's no way that we're going to be able to fix these little problems that we're having with our government, with our mass incarceration, with our drug problem, with our gun problem. You know, how can someone who get, has a gun get, you know, held up with a gun and you have open carry now? There's a lot of things that we have a lot of problems with in our world right now. 
and um, things that I'm more than willing to help out with if you'd allow me to. So. I just want to point out that uh, when I was taking a reentry class in the Texas Department of Criminal Justice, apparently the old fashioned way of handling the question was to say, we'll discuss the interview in that space. The way we were taught to handle it was to say, see attached, we were taught to write an attachment letter. So the problem with, with the slash uh, format is that you're lying on your application. You can get fired later for lying on your application. But, but let me tell you what, I had a friend who uh, was in for felony DWI. Why is there felony DWI? Anyway, she had a master's degree. She paroled out, and uh, she was having trouble finding jobs. She got was would get a job for a while, and she was telling me she had trouble. Then she she would disclose the felony on the application. She gets some job that that was not uh, in, in line with her professional and educational background, and then they would go ahead and fire her anyway and say they had done it because she was a felon when they already knew she was a felon when they hired her. So this is a big issue. Hi, good evening. My question is an extension to uh, San Juan. Um, I work with school age youth on the west side of San Antonio, 78207 zip code. And they're uh, similar to what San Juan was saying. Our, our school looks like a, a prison right now. It's very similar to what we're seeing across the country. We use uh, punitive measures and systems in our schools and even in my classroom because I have to abide by you know, the, the campus policies. Uh, compounded with the fact that a lot of our kids have parents in prison currently. I'm just curious that if y'all were invited into a classroom, how would you introduce or creatively express uh, this issue with kids? Let me talk to them kids. <laughs> <laughs> I think an important thing with families is we can't normalize prison. Prison can't be the normal. Uh, it's, it's not a good place. You know, when kids go to visit their prison, their parents in prison, they go, It's it looks forbidding, but they get inside and they feed them candy and snacks and pop, you know, and it, it's, it's, it's not a good thing. And I think, I don't, I don't know how else, since I didn't deal with the child issue because it was my son, I don't know how we stop them. I think part of it comes from the expectation that, you know, because you did this, you will go to prison. Because once we plant the seed in their mind that they're going to be a failure, or they're going to go to prison, it will happen, I promise you. So that's where we have to start, is in the schools, letting them know that they have a pro if they have a problem, how can we fix it? Because you too count, and you're important, and you can succeed. I would really like to see the parents of those kids coming to meetings like this or holding meetings themselves and um, you know uniting and saying this is not I mean if they're a prison they can't I understand that but um, whoever their guardian is or if one of their parents is available because um, you know the kids can do I can't even say they can do so much. They can't do much. Um, I think having them express what they're going through and what they think and what they feel is very healthy. But in terms of getting any change within the schools and the school districts, the adults around them are going to have to, to take a stand. This is a fact um, that the Carnes and Dilly uh, prisons are being considered as child care facilities. Federal Judge G from California said you can't keep children in prisons and therefore you have to let them out. So what the state of Texas did, the Department of Family and Protective Services did, is they lowered the standards and now they're calling those two prisons child care facilities to allow children as young as six months old, 18, to be there with their mothers. I don't care if they're there a day or two, or two days or a week or whatever. But they're already getting in their brain at that very young age that they are in prison. And let me tell you, they are in prison. They have guards. They have they have to pass through metal detectors. They have to do all of these things. And these are kids. I just can't believe that we're doing that. But that's what's happening in the state. And once you normalize that, what she said, and people get it in their brain, then they're going to go to the other ones. The other prison. Um. I, I want 
to say that if I was going to go into a school, I think the most important thing that I do anytime I go in front of a group is to humanize. Because our media frames and other things, they dehumanize. So I spoke about getting an op-ed piece in Express News this weekend on Saturday, and then the next day they put on the opinion front about a female prisoner in Gainesville that she's a monster. So I sent an email out about that yesterday. This, I think Jennifer said this really well earlier, but as several people have said different versions of that, which is we're talking about human beings who make mistakes at worst. Now, there are, probably, there are different levels of mistakes and, and different laws and different severity. And as a battery survivor, I don't want to deny that. But um, when, when we can, and we, if, so if I go into a school, I would want to humanize the issue. Often when I bring up the issue of wrongful arrest of battered women, I have a handout that has what our current self-defense and defense of third-party waivers on, what SCR 26 says. And then I will bring up scenarios of different incarcerated battered women. I'll, I'll mention them by their first name and their scenario. I'll say, does the current law apply? And I think that's the best way to get through. So all, all of us who are on this panel who have actually been arrested or put in jail or uh, put in prison by the state. We provide one perspective. Family members provide another perspective. These are all ways of, of humanizing it. So it'd be, it'd be some kind of humanization, you know, because they, they need to know that. So they're, they're, that, that the school as institution has taught that process. And then maybe we'll grow up with people who will think about what real justice is as opposed to the, I, I remember when they were doing the voir dire for my jury, I think the prosecutor said there were three ideas there was a rehabilitation, deterrence, and punishment. And we're really in this punishment mentality that is not justice. And also, I'd like to say that we, we deal, I mean, we gotta look at the structural inequalities. And we, we need to get more people activated in fighting uh, for political representation and bringing dollars into their communities. And those are the things that we're not, we're not thinking about when it's, you know, we see things uh, around us, but yet we're not really analyzing why is it, why is it that way in that community, but it's different. You go to a different high school in an affluent neighborhood, and that high school looks way different, and their programs are way different, and they're, the stu you know, the race, the uh, people that rep represent them as as uh, black and brown people. I mean, they don't, they don't actually see their teachers uh, that look like them, and so that all that really comes into what's going on in their head. My name is um, Nat, and I work in schools of some on the east side, and so I help do their teamwork. I mean, good morning. <laughs> we all work together on the east side and the west side. Um, but for us, it'd be it's similar to um, the question that you asked. But what kind of advice would you give to our students? I mean, I work in a middle school and. On a regular, and I know that everybody works in high school, on a regular, it's something that's normal for them. They're like, all right, miss, you know, I might not be back next week because I might get shot, or I might be in prison. Um, and that's something that to them is very normal to say to me. Um, and a lot of times talking to them, they'll be like, well, my family's in prison, or this person's in prison. So for them, it's something that it doesn't matter. So what is it, what is something that I can say or that we can give as advice? Um, to kind of help them see the drastic change that will happen in your life when you go to prison for life. I don't know if I would even address that with them. I mean, I would, I would take the opposite tact, and I would talk to them about how this is not your destiny. Your destiny is what you create. You know, it's 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 in your mind. It's what you think of yourself, and um, I would just present as many opportunities for them to imagine and build and dream about the life they want and being the most that they can be. Um, and that it doesn't mean that their parent is a bad person or can't have a different life when they return. I agree with that and I think we need to give them as many opportunities to succeed. Because I think uh, with my looking back is it seems like we perpetuate the failures and so we want to create opportunities where they can succeed, be successes, and know that they can, they can make something out of themselves, but help them dream big and study and stay in school, because education is the most important thing 
for our youth these days? Um, I think one thing that I do, I, I spoke to a batter intervention prevention class for women in November. So these are women, some of them are women who defended themselves against batters. Some of these are, are women who have committed domestic violence related offenses and have been ordered to take this kind of class. And I say this at every level, but I think it can be taught in the school system, it needs to be. And I mentioned it earlier, is to teach uh, students to use their channels of grievance. And part of that is learning about our laws and how our, our system is constructed and what the court system is. But to really know that that constitution is, is supposed to be for everybody and that uh, there are inequities in how the Constitution and the laws are applied, but that Constitution is for every, everybody. And then there, 40, uh, Title 42 of the United States Code, Section 1983, says if somebody violates your civil rights, you can sue them. Uh, we hear about this a lot with conditions of confinement lawsuits in prison, but this can be used for any civil rights violation. So oftentimes when you hear about a civil rights offense, uh, a lawsuit, that's what it is. So some of it is the legal stuff. It, just writing skills, oratory skills, being, learning to go talk to whoever it is, whether you're in school, whatever your workplace is. There's always a grievance process. That's that's part of it, and to feel active because, and then to know. And Sasha mentioned this earlier, and I didn't talk a lot about it, but she she said it very well. When you use that grievance process, there is a chance you will be retaliated against. There's a good chance, and then you've got to find a way to grieve that. And I know when I was in prison, I, if I was utilizing the internal grievance process and it was working, then I'd have to remind myself, okay, I'm gonna write letters to legislators for a while. I'm gonna write a piece that I'll put out there to the media uh, or to a criminal justice reform group. There are different, different ways, different channels of grievance. So those are some of the things that, that I would suggest along with what's already so articulate we've been saying. Let me come talk to the kids. And I have one more comment to that, is when it comes to grievances and to kids, they need somebody to watch over them. Uh, I know when they're in the system, it's the family members that can best protect them when there's wrongdoing and with the grievances. Children, children the same way. They need their parents involved. And you have to keep them involved. Yeah, I'm with Max. I, let me talk to the kids, but to you as teachers and educators, I'm the son of an educator. Um, my mother worked with um, severely autistic, what they used that term then, but the behavioral challenge with really young kids. She was also battered um, for 13 years, so I watched that. So my psychology when it comes to pouring into young boys and young girls, especially young boys and young girls of color, but all children, um, it was said earlier, they need to know that they matter. They need to know that whatever they believe, whatever they dream, they can achieve. And you already know that. So there's really no rule, rule book or formula but to keep pouring into those kids. Because their reality, as it was said, does not necessarily determine their destiny, but we cannot negate their reality. Because when they leave the confines, for lack of a better word, of their school, they go back to that reality. And what they face at home, whether it's you know, no heat, no water, no food, and they come back the next day. Like, we cannot, you know, say, well, that doesn't matter because that's what makes them who they are. And so their environments, our environments made us. But you have to continue to just continue to bond, continue to connect, continue to board. I'm like, Max, I'm, I'm willing to come to your classroom as well. I just wanted to ask, was any of these organizations addressing any of the issues other than just to talk about the Constitution. The 13th Amendment, you know, the dealing with the 13th Amendment, it says that neither slavery nor involuntary servitude should exist except as a punishment for a crime whereof the party shall have been duly convicted, shall exist within the United States or any place subject to their jurisdiction formally abolished in slavery in the United States, the 13th Amendment was passed by Congress on January 31st, 1865. So as, as uh, Brother Mike talked about earlier, and so much, so many of us tonight have so eloquently, it's a system. You know, if we're not studying, as your sister said, the system, 
then we're upholding the system. You know, we just went out, went out this past holiday and spent thousands and thousands of dollars supporting corporate America that sustains the system. They put money into the system. The young sister talked about the private, privatization of prisons. I'm from Michigan, and I came through the prison system. And I was working in the control center where corporate executives came into the prison with no badges, walked into the prison, into a front boardroom office, and was looking at prison catalogs to open up prisons of their own in small towns to provide jobs for those people in those towns. So that's what the system is all about. So if I have this as a foundation, the 13th Amendment, and if I need free labor, as, as we know in the late 70s or early 80s, the prison system went from rehabilitation to industrialization. So if, if we know all of this, we have to teach this to our children because then they'll begin to understand why the condition of their neighborhood is as it is and the condition of the neighborhood on the other side of the freeway is in the condition that it is because one side of the freeway is to fuel the living and the means of existence for the other side of the freeway. So my um, question is, you know, is any of these organizations dealing with the true understanding of the Constitution of the system? Yeah, it is for everybody, but it don't mean the same for everybody. Having our sons been slaves to the prison system, we have to acknowledge that it is an industry and it will be hard to dismantle this industry. Some of the most disheartening stuff I've heard in the state legislature is looking for new revenue streams. And I think, Marguerite, you've been battling this here in San Antonio with the visit, uh, video visitation. They keep looking at ways to get more money out of families. During the last session, they took some of the products that these prisoners made and they made them available to retired state employees. What's up with that? You know, why why does that get passed by our legislature? And I'll present that to you, Mr. Clark. It, it just doesn't make any sense. They do it on the backs of our loved ones to perpetuate it. I know some guys are so worried that they do their job so well that they'll never get out because they'll want to keep them in their work. So that's... That's what I have. What was your name again, sir? Brother Terrence. Well, uh, I want to thank you, Brother Terrence, for your question. I'm not sure I can say that Free Better Texas Women specifically is working on the, some of the direct questions that you're talking about, but there's no doubt that that amendment was written so that when the slaves were freed, they could be, you know, made to work again on plantations. And, and in the Texas Department of Criminal Justice, they had cotton fields, and that's where the inmates worked in, and they have host squads. And as somebody who entered the Texas Department of Criminal Justice with a PhD with, and with professional communication experience, I was supposed to work on the host squad, and I refused to do it, because I went into TDC with computer-related repetitive strain injuries in my neck, hands, arms, and back, that I'm supposed to have lifetime medical through the Workers' Compensation Commission uh, order with, and that's been a whole thing I've been dealing with lately because doctors are refusing to do that, but I refuse to do that. So I was told by a host squad officer when I got in, white, white host squad officer, um, that you need to look at what you're wearing, nobody's gonna pay attention to you, and if you don't do what we say, then when you come up for parole, you're going to say that you're not adapting to the institutional environment. So this is this definitely is an issue that needs to be dealt with. Uh, TDCJ prisoners are not paid like they are in some other states or like they are in, in the feds, and it, it's a it's a, it's a huge issue. I, I could go on and on about this. I just want to give you a nod there and thank you. Real quick, just you know, like the Black and People Organization, they work diligently hard. Uh, every single one of them, they work really, really hard to abolish prisons and to uh, get rid of the uh, prison industrial complex. They work every day. Uh, they find ways to go around this and jump through loopholes to go visit people inside just to 
keep an idea and keep an update as to what's going on in certain prisons. Some are worse than others. They're all bad, nonetheless, but some are worse than others. And it, they, they try their hardest to get into those to just infiltrate, basically, just find out what is going on to make it better for someone who has to go to prison. And the thing about that is, is, is uh, with that organization, like I said earlier, it's grown from a start of 10 people in the beginning, and, and, and in 10 years it's grown to 2,500 individuals who help fight to do that. So as long as we network and keep doing what we're doing, we can make it bigger and bigger and bigger to where one day we won't have any more fences, to where that won't happen anymore. And we did work with Breslin's leadership at the helm to close two prisons in Texas, with the one in Mineral Wells and one in Dawson. But that's only by network and working together that we can get this done. And that's the importance of us being here and working together and closing more prisons and getting some more of these laws passed and bringing our loved ones home.